and 10. The time is approximately 6.30. Tonight we will be discussing the budgets from account number 0910, Public Works Administration, to account 0970, Wastewater Transfer of Water, Wastewater and Solid Waste Funds. Two is a discussion of the budgets account numbers 1110, Recreation Department, Peacedale Office Building, Neighborhood Guild, and Senior Services Funds, and three other matters of interest and concerns. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Alfred. Thanks, Steve. Okay, we're going to start tonight on page N29 uh, for the Public Services Department, the Engineering Division, <laughs> account uh, 0910. So that's on narrative uh, page 29. We're also going to be referencing in the uh, general fund expenditures, uh, the actual uh, number detail is on GF, or general fund, page 16, starts with the uh, Public Services Department. The uh, first account is the uh, Public Services uh, Department administration account uh, for the 2010-2011 uh, uh, year. The uh, proposal is for $253,272. It's $811 over what the current year appropriation was. The uh, narrative, as I have mentioned in the past, is an important consideration in evaluating the uh, budgetary needs of the town. Uh, each of the departments is providing information on trends, impacts, and issues that the departments are working with, as well as uh, specific performance measures that uh, they are looking at and what goals are for the 2010-2011 year. Uh, for, uh, uh, for this department, uh, administration provides for uh, the technical uh, oversight for design and construction of public works infrastructure, the streets and highway resurfacing, as well as street lights, uh, tree program, uh, and general capital improvements. John's department also is responsible uh, mm. under a team management as far as working with planning department, manager's office, or any of the other municipal departments that have uh, physical brick and mortar uh, projects underway. Public services also provides direct assistance to the planning department and planning board for subdivision review and for uh, all utility installations associated with uh, any of the planning projects that are going through that system. I think uh, something that you'll be hearing more about as we go forward is the department's responsibilities to deal with uh, phase water, stormwater regulations phase two. Uh, as noted in the narrative, there is a number of uh, budgetary requirements associated with uh, stormwater uh, uh, outfall uh, testing requirements. In fact, the state has increased from uh, four parameters up to 16 for what uh, must be uh, uh, completed at this point. We're in better shape than most towns. All of our uh, stormwater drainage uh, has been properly uh, uh, documented. It's uh, been assigned GIS reference numbers so that our mapping system is in place to show where all of the locations are for stormwater that has to be managed. We also have to provide annual reporting to the state on the testing that's done as well as the cleaning. One of the other uh, conditions that is placing more pressure on this department is the requirements for street sweeping and the disposal of those materials. And we'll get into that with the uh, streets and highway department. But uh, it's a multifaceted uh, uh, administrative responsibility for brick and mortar if there's any questions, uh, be glad to deal with those at this time, or we'll move on. Uh, any questions? No. Nope. Move on, Steve. Uh, moving on to page N31 of the narrative uh, for the Public Services Streets and Highway Division, account uh, uh, 0920. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the Streets and Highway Division it's responsible for uh, the maintenance of the street system as well as the right-of-way system in South Kingstown. Uh, the uh, highway division has uh, uh, crews that uh, deal with uh, uh, stormwater drainage, sidewalk repairs, replacements, as well as any other uh, infrastructure requirements. Uh, this is the department that's responsible for the, uh, the outfall <coughs> inspections with the stormwater. A couple of things to note. We're looking at a budget that is $1,738,000. Uh, this department 
has had a reduction of uh, one person uh, in that, uh, that department uh, based on funding uh, requirements. And we've also uh, revised one job from a, a, crew, a crew foreman to a uh, heavy equipment operator with the replacement of, uh, of an individual that uh, has retired from the town services. A uh, couple of concerns that we have is that we have uh, have operated over the past few years with two street sweepers with uh, the, one of those two, which was a replacement. Uh, we replaced but kept on uh, online and in service uh, is probably going to uh, fail uh, sometime within the next year or two. Uh, what that means is it will diminish the department's ability to be able to uh, maintain the uh, uh, sweeping program, which is also a part of that uh, state program for uh, proper road maintenance. Uh, the department is also seeing higher costs associated with uh, uh, the snow removal uh, program. Uh, as noted in uh, John's memorandum, salt prices, uh, which were as high as $87, are going down to $75, but that's fluctuating market. Uh, we spend uh, approximately uh, uh, $350,000 on professional service equipment purchase, uh, material purchases uh, and uh, providing uh, direct services. We've reduced that line item, the 290 account, from 352 down to $344,000. The chemical and gases, which includes the sand and the salt, uh, we're forecasting $185,000 down from $204,000 for, uh, for those types of materials. So as uh, noted last night with many of the uh, departments, uh, the budget has been cut back to a level which we do not think that it can be cut much lower. Uh, we uh, believe that uh, as long as prices stay in line with what had been anticipated, uh, we shall uh, be able to stay within budget if not, this would be uh, a department that uh, we'd have concerns, may need contingency charges at the end of the year. There is very little flexibility there. John, do you want to talk about uh, the, uh, the streets program and the other uh, federal requirement dealing with the, uh, the new uh, sign requirements for all street signs? Yeah, there's a, there's a new federal highway requirement for retro, rec retro reflectivity. And what it does is it's, it's the backing for the signage. It has a, a prism effect to it. Mm -hmm. So the first signage that we're replacing are stop signs. And then once we get through the stop signs, we'll start working on the, the street identifier name signs. So that's going to take us a, a number of years to do that. And we're doing that through our street sign uh, appropriation in the budget. John, can you make sure that mic's on or be closer to it? Oh, sorry about that. Any questions? Uh, if not, we'll move on to uh, the uh, uh, tree management program. Account uh, zero nine five zero. Yes, Steve. Jim. I'm sorry, uh, John or Steve. Um, do we take care of the street sweeping on the state uh, roads, or is the state state S state's responsible for state roads? And the state's also responsible in the state law to sweep their sidewalks once a year. So, the last couple of years, DOT has actually been pretty good about that. Yeah. yeah. I know, I think last year downtown, we have, were given warnings to try to help with the sidewalks to push the sand out. Right, we, we do, the town does do the downtown area from okay. uh, Columbia Street down to High Street for the merchants, and we try to do that once or twice during the winter time, even though it, even though it is a state road. Uh, tree program, tree program for uh, 1011 on page N32. $22,641, it's down about $1,343 from the current year. This provides for the stipend that's paid to the uh, tree warden, uh, Bill Wallace, who's held that position, I think, before trees were invented. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, it really provides uh, two accounts. One is uh, for the, uh, professional services. This is for uh, uh, emergency tree repair, uh, and maintenance uh, uh, when we have uh, downed limbs or downed trees. Uh, this would be for outside services. We would hire an, an arborist uh, uh, that this is jobs that we wouldn't be able to, uh, to do in-house. There's very little money that's been uh, appropriated this year for uh, uh, agricultural materials. This would be to replace street trees. Uh, 
at this point, uh, we do not have uh, the financial resources to really be able to invest in replacement of trees and uh, purchase of, uh, of tree stock. So that has been reduced to $1,000. That money would be leveraged with uh, uh, monies either through uh, uh, Tree America or in terms of working with uh, uh, people within subdivisions that are interested in, uh, in matching trees that we, were that we would put in. So at this point, we're looking at uh, a budget of $22,641. There's no questions. The next account uh, is the street uh, lighting program. The town is responsible for uh, paying National Grid for the rental of the street, uh, uh, street lighting uh, throughout the town. The town is responsible for the street lighting on state highways other than on those where the state has uh, uh, directed the placement of the uh, of the lights. That would be uh, particularly on Route 1 at the cutoff or on uh, some of the major uh, uh, highways, 108 or uh, Old Tower Hill Road. Other than that, the town's responsible for that. We've started a program last year where uh, public services in conjunction with the police department reviewed all of the street lighting in town and provided recommendations for either uh, relighting of, of various areas with uh, lower wattage uh, bulbs to, to save on the rental costs. Those have been submitted to National Grid and we're waiting for them to do some of the conversion. We're hopeful that with that conversion that we'll be able to meet the budget which we're estimating is $20,000 below what the current year of $190,000 appropriation was. John, you may want to talk about that uh, lighting study. Yeah, the, the, the police department did go through every single street light in town. We have the, a complete inventory from National Grid as to the pole, the wattage for the bulb, and the locations, and they went through and knocked down a lot of the wattages. Uh, you know, some of them are incidental from, you know, 50 to, from 100 to 75 watts. The, there's a couple, though, that were like two or 300 watts, and we're trying to understand why they were that bright to begin with. But we've knocked those back, and National Grid's telling me within the next couple of months those change outs are supposed to occur at no cost to the town. And fortunately, we're doing it now because we've also been told, I believe as of April 1st, we've made the request prior to then that they will begin charging for that service. So we're a little proactive in trying to get those bulb wattages reduced. John, are there some streets that could go without lighting altogether? Some town in the paper today it was cutting their budget in half. Yeah, I, I know one socket was looking to reduce the number of street lights by 50%. Um, in fact, we still occasionally get uh, street light, new street light requests through the T squared RC. I think intersections are the ones, or you know, obviously curbs are the ones where uh, our greatest concern. I guess that's something we can consider, but I think at, at this point the first step is to reduce the wattages. So we're we're doing that, and I think once that's complete, then I think at that point we can take another look through the T-squared RC and see if there's places where we can eliminate, eliminate street lights. Cost savings are also limited with light removal because we have leased those lights with National Grid. For them to remove the lights, there's a, uh, uh, there's a removal cost as well as a, uh, an out fee that's necessary for a period of time once that light is removed. Yeah, I think actually what's happening in Woonsocket, if from, from my memory serves me, they're actually capping the sensor. And even for that, they're charging, I think it's $25 a light, in anticipation that there may be enough backlash to take the cap off rather than take the light off the pole and put it back again. So I and think all the, every community is going through the same problem. And some of the towns have gone to allowing the residents who are not satisfied mm -hmm. with the lights that have been removed to pay direct fee to have those lights uh, installed in front of their property or to be uh, decapped uh, at those properties. Uh, I don't think we want to get to that level. I think what we want to do is to see what we can save in terms of uh, uh, reduced lighting costs and then go from, uh, go from that point. But the number of new street light requests that come in that go to the traffic uh, commission at this point uh, Unless it's in a, uh, an area that's a high traffic area or an intersection, most of those requests are being turned down. If there's uh, no questions, we'll move on to the wastewater fund transfer. 
As the council is aware, the wastewater enterprise fund provides all dollars necessary for the operation of the wastewater treatment plant, its infrastructure, and pumping stations. What it does not, and it, and it collects the money through user fees from everybody that is a, uh, a customer on that uh, wastewater system. When the town established a ISDS management district ordinance, and we began to uh, inspect all on-site sewage disposal systems uh, and set up a seven-year cycle for reviewing all of the uh, uh, ISDS in the town, those would be sewer, uh, private sewer systems that are not on the town sewer system. We can't use money from the wastewater fund because th those are user fees directly paid by people that would have no benefit. So what we have done in the past is in the use of a $3 million grant, we were able to establish a five-year uh, paid position for managing the ISDS uh, inspection program. That grant expired, I believe, two years ago. We are now at this point needing to use tax dollars to be able to continue the effort to ensure that the uh, ISDS systems are up to standard, cesspools are removed, proper systems are installed, and that they are pumped on uh, an appropriate frequency basis. Uh, to do that, uh, we have in the past paid uh, for a part-time position. What we have uh, instituted this year is a shared position with the pretreatment coordinator in the wastewater program who is now spending several hours a week to manage the ISDS program for us. The value of the <coughs> hours that are assigned for ISDS uh, district works out to about $9,000. That $9,000 is what's proposed for transfer this year. As you can see, that's a savings of $14,000 from the current year when we had an independent person that was hired as a part-time employee to be able to manage that system. We're expecting that this will be, I think, the sixth of the seven-year cycle, uh, and there's approximately 950 uh, units that will need to get notice of inspection and uh, then be able to provide uh, uh, proof of, uh, of inspection and we have to manage any uh, notices of violation. So with that, uh, we expect to be able to do that with the pretreatment coordinator being assigned specific hours in the course of the week to be able to uh, uh, manage that administrative function. And it certainly is also another way of what we're trying to cut, uh, cut program uh, cost in terms of trying to join positions. Are we supposed to have it on the video screen? <coughs> The video uh, feed. I, I did not put that up okay. because uh, we're sorry. not going. We're not going to be able to see the the, the number detail. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, if the council wants, I can have that up. If if it's better for you to see. No, I got my glasses tonight, so I can <laughs> see better. Last night I was really having a problem. Let me see. No. Thank you. Just was wondering. That concludes the uh, general fund component of public services. I would ask the, uh, the council to uh, go to the tab for the water enterprise fund, which stops, starts on, uh, you guessed it, W1. If you go on the computer, you can pull up the budget. Water fund, Jim, W1. Starting on uh, on page uh, N, uh, W1 for the narrative on the water uh, enterprise fund, uh, page one of the uh, of the document shows a, uh, a detailed breakout of what the uh, major costs are of the water enterprise fund. Uh, we're 
projecting a budget of $959,361. It's a $20,000 increase over the current year budget. We are seeing about a $28,000 reduction in operational expenses and $1,500 reduction in materials and supplies. Debt services are approximately the same. It's a $118 increase. Capital budget is up five, uh, $5,000. The major cost driver increase in uh, the budget is the uh, system-wide depreciation. As explained in the narrative, uh, the objective based on accounting standards that were set into place in the 2005-2006 year is to determine what the depreciation value is associated with the infrastructure and facilities that make up both uh, any of our enterprise funds. So what that uh, program does is it looks at each program component, whether it's the pipe in the ground, uh, whether it's the, uh, any pumping facilities, and uh, assigns a uh, useful life to that equipment, and then looks at what the cost of replacement will be, and then takes what the yearly uh, value of depreciation is. When we look system-wide, the uh, annual depreciation associated with the plant that is in place uh, is approximately $180,000. We had budgeted $135,000 last year, which was not inclusive of the depreciation on the uh, new metering system that was installed. That cost will have to be recognized in the 9-10 year. So bringing that cost back up to the $180,000 shows us why you've got a $44,000 increase in the expenses. But again, it's not operationally driven. It's really based on recognizing and then funding the full value of what depreciated elements are. The good news is that people sitting in your seat 10 years from now will not see a capital improvement item <laughs> because there won't be a need for capital improvements because yeah. the funds that are built up in the depreciation account would then be used and expended to be able to re replace various system components after they've uh, reached their useful life. Mm -hmm. But until we get to that point, uh, John calls it double dipping. It's actually a case where we're having to, uh, to fund what should have been funded when the system was first put online in the early 1970s or 80s. So once we get to a point where uh, those reserves for depreciation are appropriate, that would be the funding source for all future capital improvements. Uh, I'll give you that explanation now, and I won't give it to you again with the wastewater fund because it's the same. Okay. The costs are much higher for the depreciation on the wastewater system, but obviously because the system is much more uh, expensive, uh, Bernie doesn't buy anything that's cheap. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, and Louis, Louis doesn't spend a penny if he doesn't have to. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> that is true. The, uh, the water system, we are not recommending any changes in the, uh, the rate structure. The last rate increase was back in July of 2008. The annual uh, operating uh, uh, cost for a uh, residential unit is $165 per year, plus uh, anything over 5,000 cubic feet of water use is charged at uh, a rate of $2.68. Uh, 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 we are recommending that the excess charge be increased to $2.71 and that would uh, come to the council in, ad in advance of July of 2010. The way water billing and sewer billing is set up, any excess charge is based, uh, is, is billed in the, in the following year, but is a uh, receivable of the prior year. So if we're going to charge 271, we need to give the people notice in advance of them using the water uh, so that when we build them in October of 2011, uh, it will be for water use between July of 2010 and June of uh, June 30th of 2011. So the only increase that we're looking at is a 5% increase on the cost of excess. Something that's a uh, of Im importance is also that the General Assembly has passed legislation in 2009 that will mandate by December 31st of uh, 2013 that all water systems bill on a quarterly basis. At the current time, we bill once a year. 
we will have the ability to do that uh, because we can do monthly uh, meter readings, but what it'll require us to do where we now have one bill is to actually send out four bills. The billing will also have to be restructured so that there will be a uh, minimum quarter bill for administrative purposes and then a uh, water use component or a second part of that bill on, uh, on a quarterly basis will be for the exact amount of water that's been used. Uh, the long-term objective of uh, the state in passing this type of legislation is that we anticipate that uh, they will look to have surcharges placed on water use during summer months as a means of trying to uh, promote conservation and uh, reduce the amount of uh, watering or uh, activities, uh, summer activities that would occur for use of uh, uh, domestic water. Uh, once that type of a billing system is in place, you may see a structure that would be required that would say for three quarters of the year, the excess is at $2.71 for the water that's used in July, August, and September. The billing rate may have a surcharge of 10 or 15%. This would not be just in South Kingstown, but this would be an objective of trying to provide better water conservation efforts on a statewide basis. But the billing system, I believe, is the first step in attempting to uh, introduce water conservation mm -hmm. uh, methodology into, uh, uh, into the water utility on a statewide basis. It will cost us more money, obviously, mm -hmm. to send out four bills than, mm -hmm. than one bill. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if there was ever any uh, serious fiscal impact statement uh, developed in advance of the legislation mm -hmm. being approved. But uh, it is something that we will have to look at. We may need to uh, jump to the quarterly billing in advance of the uh, December 31st of 2013. We may need to start that in the start of the 13-14 year. That's a significant increase, I would think, Bill, in like that. And again, we're right now we're, we are meter reading monthly, and the primary purpose for that is for us to flag leaks with customers mm -hmm which is, it's really been a big benefit to the customer. So, I mean, the, the technology is available, you know, it's, it's gonna be the billing costs and the collection costs that's, that's gonna increase significantly yeah. from what it is now. Yeah. Uh, um, there's about 2,750 in the, both water systems. Oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, all all properties have been changed over to the new automated reading. Hmm. Yep. I thought I'm sorry, I thought you asked how many were on the system. <laughs> One of the other things that we expect uh, probably in the 11-12 year is that uh, there's been no water rate increases for uh, United Water since uh, I believe it was back in uh, 98, was it, John? Yeah, it's been a while. Hmm. Uh, and they will be in for a uh, Actually, it was 2002, they went in for the last water rate increase. The South Shore water system and Middle Bridge systems do not uh, generate or produce their own water or, or process their own water. What we do is through a, uh, uh, we purchase the water through United Water on a wholesale basis. If uh, they're successful in getting a rate increase, uh, we expect that it would have impact in the 11-12 year. We would, uh, as we did in 2002, recommend that the town uh, intervene into the uh, uh, PUC hearings to ensure that our concerns are heard at the time that, uh, that they go forward. I think one of the main reasons why we haven't seen rate increases town-wide for United Water is because of the value of the revenues that they've generated from the wholesale uh, sale to the town of South Kingstown for uh, Middle Bridge and for uh, South Shore. Right now, uh, we're uh, uh, doing almost uh, almost 18, uh, 18 million cubic feet of water in purchase uh, per year, and that's shown on page uh, W3. Uh, uh, the account detail that you were asking about is also there, Jim, on, uh, on W3, where you can see uh, the amount of water that we purchase and the amount of water that we sell. 
Uh, the difference between the two would be lost water or water that goes through fire hydrants. One of the uh, benefits of the, uh, the new electronic metering system is it provides us with an opportunity to better isolate where lost water is. It also provides us with an opportunity in a seasonal area like South Shore to be able to determine if uh, uh, people have leaks when there's nobody occupying those houses because we can see if there's water going through that meter and if the houses are unoccupied, we contact the property owner to advise them that they, they need to do inspection. Uh, so there's been, uh, there's been a lot of good that's come out of the, uh, the new technology. I think there's a lot more that will uh, come out of it as we go forward. But as the technology increases, the uh, ability for the state to insert itself into our, uh, into our program uh, becomes, uh, uh, becomes more apparent. What are some of the reasons that they would appear before the PUC for a rate increase? They are a private, uh, privately held right. water company. By who? French, Danish, German, somebody over there? Yeah, the, 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 the corporate yeah. parent is, uh, is, is a French, uh, okay. French company. But because they sell water as a private water company and they also uh, transport water uh, to Narragansett outside of one geographic area, they're required to uh, have their rates approved through the Public Utilities Commission. Okay. But what would, uh, you said there been, um, the, was the last time they appeared before the PUC for a rate increase. What are some of the reasons uh, they would look for a rate increase in the years ahead? I think it would be what their cost of water uh, uh, production is as well as the uh, uh, more expenses associated with operating their system. With the PUC, they're required to, uh, to provide documentation and to show what their uh, uh, rate of return on investment is. One of the things we would be interested in is whether or not the wholesale rate was uh, being proposed for a major increase or whether it was a, a smaller increase or what was a reasonable increase. Other things that they may be looking at is increasing fire hydrant rates in Wakefield. We'd want to be aware of those type of things as well as to attempt to protect uh, the, uh, the rate payers uh, town-wide rather than just in the uh, South Shore or in the uh, Middle Bridge area. Is there a way to measure reserves like oil, gas? Uh, is there I mean, is this as far as unlimited available, available <laughs> capacity? Water as, far, as far as available capacity, safe yield. Um, safe yield is a very difficult uh, quantity <coughs> to get your arms around. There's been a number of studies done. Um, I'd like to say at this point that United has sufficient safe yield. You know, 10, 15 years from now, I don't know if that's going to be the the case or not. If this continued development. I just didn't know if the pressure had changed over the years, if they had to you know, sink a new well or... No, I mean, typically with groundwater supply is we rehabil rehabilitate the wells every other year, and United does that as well to make sure that it's as efficient as possible for withdrawal. Thank you. United Water also owns a uh, water resource in Kingston that has been undeveloped, the, uh, the Mayfield, uh, which is off of uh, Plains Road. Uh, Pl uh, Plains Road. So if they were in need of additional capacity, they would have the ability to go through water resources regulations to be able to install additional wells. The benefit of that uh, would be interconnectivity with the Kingston water uh, system as well so that one of the objectives should be to have all of our water systems interconnected. Uh, the problems with the interconnectivity though uh, is difficult from the state perspective because they do not want to see water resources from one uh, recharge area distributed to another area. So th there's, there is a good deal of regulation that goes on with that, but uh, uh, water resources in, uh, in South County uh, and more particularly South Kingstown seem to be more than adequate at this point. Thank you. If you move on to uh, uh, page uh, uh, W4 of the narrative, uh, this provides uh, a lion's share of the uh, user fees. As you can see, the uh, 2,749 uh, units at $165, uh, producing the 450,000. The additional units or oversized meters, these would be 
uh, places like uh, Mary Carpenter's or Roy's uh, generating 46 and prorated uh, new accounts for 3,800. And then the excess, we expect to, uh, you know, to sell about uh, 7.2 uh, uh, million gallon uh, cubic feet of water uh, and generate about $195,000 at that $2.71 rate. So overall, the system will generate uh, about $698,000 from the user base. While the cost is uh, 959, the remainder of those, uh, those funds are coming from uh, the largest uh, uh, dollar amount is coming from the cell rentals. Cell tower rental on the two water tanks uh, are predicted to generate $220,000 in the 2010-2011 year. Uh, without those uh, to be able to pay down the cost of depreciation, the cost on uh, uh, cost of service would go up on a per customer basis. Any questions on water? Nope. If not, we'll move on to the uh, wastewater, which uh, starts on page WW1, Wastewater Enterprise Fund. The first page of the, uh, of the narrative provides a capsule as to uh, the cost of the, uh, the wastewater uh, program. Operational expenses are up about $7,000. Uh, this is another department that uh, has lost a, uh, an employee. When we talked about the general fund, we talked about the 4.6 people that were, re uh, were done away with there. Uh, we have also, uh, reduced the employment base in the wastewater department by one, uh, one person. That also is based on a retirement that's occurring. Uh, that's one of the uh, ways of us being able to keep the operational expense increase down to the 7,100. Employees in this department are uh, obtaining a 2.25% salary increase, uh, just as our employees in the general fund. And again, they received no salary increase in the current 9-10 year. Uh, debt service stays uh, uh, relatively constant. The depreciation expense is, uh, uh, is at, uh, down about $30,000, but it's still at $342,000. The capital budget is three hundred. dollars Recognize that that three hundred dollars isn't South Kingstown cost alone. It would be shared with the university and with the uh, town of Narragansett. The costs that are presented in this display are for uh, the regional program itself. So you can see that uh, uh, rate base from South Kingstown is generating about $1.5 million uh, in revenue. Uh, and we're looking at the town of Narragansett's contribution at about 783,000 and the university at 591. Each of those is up about $20,000 over the prior year. We're anticipating that uh, we will uh, process over a billion gallons of wastewater uh, over the course of the 10-11 uh, year, and uh, we will be processing about uh, 5.1 uh, million gallons of septage from, the, uh, from ISDS systems uh, townwide. Overall, the system is uh, running at about, uh, I think about 50% uh, 50, uh, 50 of capacity. Uh, Next year is projected at about 56%. We've been as high as 59 to 60%, uh, and we're, uh, that would be in a very wet year. Some of the uh, wastewater systems in, uh, at the university, as well as Narragansett, are quite old and may have some type of uh, uh, infiltration issues. You'll also have infiltration uh, from the street sewer system where uh, the manholes may not be 100% tight. So what we're looking at is uh, uh, running at about 56% uh, of the plant capacity. South Kingstown also has a, uh, a large reserve set aside for plant expansion based on uh, the assessment of new customers coming in for a $1,800 uh, fee for each new customer that comes onto the system. Uh, If you look at uh, uh, page four, page four uh, provides uh, uh, the volume and the distribution. 
We're expecting that in the 2009-2010 year, which is the base year that we use for forecasting cost in the 10-11 year, that Narragansett will, uh, uh, flows will be about 45.5% of the total system. So they are the principal uh, uh, generators of the wastewater that uh, is processed at the regional plant, 19% uh, from the university and about 35% from South Kingstown. So again, about 56%. Uh, it's important to note that each of the components of the wastewater system uh, based on the flows is how the costs are assigned. Uh, if you notice in the budget document, the budget document breaks out general plant process, uh, it breaks out each of the pumping stations as separate because each of those different uh, system components have different flows. Obviously, the, uh, the University of Rhode Island has the heaviest flow that goes through the Kingston pump station, but uh, Narragansett pays zero because there's no waste that goes through there. So there's a cost allocation uh, system that is set up, and uh, I'll get to a display of that in a minute. I do want to uh, touch on, uh, on uh, page, uh, uh, page five. Page five, just as we talked about with the uh, uh, rate structure for the water fund, we're uh, currently at a rate of $220 per residential unit for use. That has not changed since the 2009 year. We've got about uh, 5,460 units within the system itself that'll generate about $1.2 million in income. Uh, excess uh, volume use on the, uh, the system uh, will we'll generate uh, another $265,000 and special users, which would be uh, users for the South County Hospital, uh, provide us with a total of about $1.5 million from South Kingstown. If we uh, move on, I'd ask the council to go to uh, page 14 of the narrative. Page 14 of the narrative provides a detail on the uh, program components of the sewer system. And as you can see here with general treatment uh, uh, process, because Narragansett would be using 45.5%, they will pay 45.5% of that regional component and so forth, sludge process because that's really the general plant. And again, this is on WW12. We're expecting the uh, you know, sludge process and disposal will cost 756,000 and that's shared among the partners. If you look at the Kingston pump station, 88% of the flow is from, King, uh, through Kingston pump station is from the university. So they're paying 88% of the cost associated with that, uh, that component of the facility. So when you get down to the bottom line, there's true cost sharing provided for each of the regional partners based on, uh, on what the predicted use is. Once the fiscal year closes and the actual flows are in place, then uh, the finance department reassigns these numbers and charges the uh, regional partners based on what the actual flow uh, through the system was. So it's an up or a down based on uh, uh, based on what actual flows are and what actual expenses are. This is a uh, uh, prognostication of what we expect it to be, both as far as the cost of process and what the, uh, the assigned uh, ratio of, uh, of use will be. But we will bill uh, each of the regional partners, inclusive of South Kingstown, based on what the actual flows and actual expenses are that are incurred for the system. We also uh, uh, delete from our operating cost the revenues that are generated from, uh, from the septic revenue because that is uh, uh, people that are non-users of the wastewater system that are paying for the, uh, for the processing of their materials going through that. Mm -hmm. So we're expecting about $309,000 in revenue and that uh, uh, discounts the regional partner share on an, equal, on an equalized basis. Uh, this is the method of, uh, uh, of uh, finance that's been used on this system uh, since its inception in 1976. 
Uh, and I don't think we've ever had a complaint from either of our partners uh, in terms of how the, uh, the billing allocation has been done. Uh, overall, we're talking about spending uh, about $3.3 million to maintain this function for the 2010-2011 uh, year. Questions? The, uh, the next account is the uh, Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. It starts on SW1 in the narrative, and this is the Enterprise Fund number 225. Uh, I'm going to let John do the presentation on this because, uh, unfortunately, he is saddled with the responsibility of dealing with our six waste haulers that are licensed in the town and uh, his uh, objective to get uh, the recycling rates up to what they are going to need to be to meet state standards, as well as the difficulty in running the facility uh, with Narragansett having no system in place for organized recycling. So with that, John, I'll let yep. you have your five minutes. Uh, we, we've been spending a lot of time on solid waste lately. I guess the good news is from 2005 till now, uh, our diversion rate regionally has increased from 9% up to about 28%. Now, since Narragansett doesn't have a curbside program, if you factor out their recycling versus the towns, and we're tracking all this very closely, when the haul is discharged at the transfer station, they have to declare where the origin of the recyclables and the waste is coming from. We estimate South Kingston's diversion rate. And these, when I talk about diversion rate, I'm, I'm just talking about the, the MRF for the materials recycling facility, right? The green and the blue bins. Mm -hmm. We believe it's up around 37%. So right now, South Kingston is exceeding the state requirement for diversion. But if you look at it regionally, we're not because Narragansett doesn't have a, a curbside program. So I, I guess that's the good news. The, the more sombering news is it's a lot of work trying to, to get the haulers to comply. I, I shouldn't say it. Two haulers have been in compliance since we implemented the program. They're exceeding the town's diversion rate. Two are very close. They're in the high 20s percentage. Sometimes they're dancing around 30 percent. The other two are down in the teens. And, you know, the haulers, in order to get the license from the town, they have to provide us their customer roles. And a lot of the problem with the customer roles is we have this, you know, a number of haulers declaring the same resident. Mm -hmm. So those get kicked out. The haulers are providing us roles that have residents from Richmond and Charleston. It's a very time consuming process to validate the roles. And then once we have the roles, we assign municipal cap to them that they can tip at the lower rate. So, and we've, and we've tried to give a, you know, a bunch of tools to the haulers. We've, you know, we've got the ordinance, which is the level playing field. We've done a lot of, you know, public education. I think what we're going to start is a, a weekly block in the times that, you know, this week, recycling this week in South Kingston with tips that we can have for the residents. Uh, we've also got two part carbonless copy, you know, violation tickets or non-compliance tickets that we've given the haulers that they can place on their customers, you know, uh, recycling container that they're not complying or not meeting compliance for a number of different reasons. Um, the only thing is the haulers that we see that are not using the toters are the ones that have some of the lower percentages. So I think I've always advocated that if the residents are recycling to the greatest extent possible, the small bins that some of the haulers are providing of not of sufficient capacity, and that's what we're still seeing. Mm -hmm. So for those haulers in the calendar year 2010 that are not meeting the diversion rate, we've given them a conditional six-month license to say, you, you know, you've got six months to get your recycling rates up to the minimum mm -hmm. town diversion rate. So I think overall we've come a long ways, but I think we've got a lot of, you know, so some ways to go at this point. And it's, it, it takes a, an inordinate amount of work on staff to, to track all these numbers and to try to encourage the hall is to get them up to do what they need to do. And at least one or two, I don't know if they're going to be able to make it or not, I'll be quite honest with you. Unless they make some profound changes in how they 
uh, deal with their customers and how they're collecting re recyclables. I mean, they're not even close at this point. The difficulties that we have are if one of the haulers gets shut off at the transfer station, we lose control of where their materials are going <coughs> or where the recycling uh, materials are going. So it's, it, is a, it is not the best system. I do want to comment that uh, we're not suggesting by any means that people in the town of Narragansett aren't recycling. A good deal of people in Narragansett are recycling particularly those that use the transfer station and the bag tag system. Uh, they are loyal to the program. They, uh, they recycle very well. In fact, our recycling rate uh, for those people using the transfer station at this point exceeds 40%. So people that use the transfer station are believers and are doing it the right way. The diff difficulty comes in uh, where you have a hauler who's got a certain got a situation where if the person if the household is not willing to recycle is he willing to give up the account because they're not recycling if everybody would agree that nobody would pick up the material unless the recycling was done we'd have better controls that is a, is part of the problem that we run into uh, but i think that we have made substantial progress the nine hundred thousand dollar grant that we received from uh, from uh, resource recovery has certainly provided us with the opportunity to provide for the education components as well as the bins. Uh, we're hopeful that Narragansett will be successful. It's not from a lack of trying to be able to get the bins. It's been a case of resource recovery has not uh, issued any additional grants and South Kingstown received theirs. So uh, I just want to make sure it's clear we're not uh, casting aspersions toward Narragansett or the lack of the organized program, we would not have been able to really put the organized program into place if we weren't able to pay for the totas using, uh, using the state money. Are we all out of totas? I'm sorry? Are we all out of those totas? No, we have, we have enough. If, if all the haulers, that the six haulers, if they all started using the haul, totas, then we would be close to running out. But I think we're going to use with the, the balance of the grant is to get more totas. And we do have requests from people who do not have curbside service that they want a toter. So I think we're trying to get those toters in and offer those to residents who feel that they should have a toter if they don't use the transfer station. We, we're not going to advocate for them to bring the toter to the transfer station because that's going to be a problem with them transferring the material. But if they want to have the toters at home to store it until such time that they go to the transfer station with their, their bags or their boxes, I think that's what we're going to try to accommodate. But yeah, the 64 gallon toters are far too big to be putting in a vehicle and and moving back and forth to the transfer station but the 64 gallon toter also provides problems for the small hauler because without having a sidearm on the truck right, to be able right. to lift the uh, uh, lift those toters up they're not going to be able to get those get the, the materials into the trucks yeah. themselves yeah. so there's uh, you know, there's process issues that are involved here that uh, really are uh, counterproductive to the recycling efforts that we're attempting to make. I did want to also have you comment on the transfer station lease and the process uh, of how much materials that they're processing at this point. Yeah, I mean, we are up in tonnage, and again, we do get a, um, you know, a, a dollar per ton for every ton that's pushed through the transfer station, so recyclables are certainly up. I mean, the haul is that are collecting the recyclables. I mean, recycling tonnage is up significantly where it was before. Uh, as is a solid waste tonnage. In fact, we just um, got our uh, transfer station operating license amended by the state, and we can now take upwards, I believe it's 320 tons of solid waste and 60 tons of recyclables a day. We're not, we're not at that point, but we have that capacity and, and availability if we need it. <coughs> Carol? Uh, John, why wouldn't all haulers Recycle. Why wouldn't they take recycle? Well, I, I think the the initial reaction is they need two vehicles. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so unless a hauler, and I don't want to you know speak for each and how they choose to do their business, but unless a hauler has enough vehicles to have, it's a duplicated route to go and pick up the recyclables. It, they're going to need another piece of equipment. Now there are two compartment trucks mm -hmm. that are you know partly solid waste and partly recyclables. But if, if you look, it's a mass balance. I mean, people produce X number of pounds of waste a week. 
So how much of that's refuse versus how much recyclables, it really doesn't make a difference. You have to collect the same amount of waste. It's just the means and how you collect it. One new thing that may be coming forward, in fact, I've got a meeting Thursday with resource recovery. Resource recovery is considering a one stream recyclable train. Right now it's separated, you got paper products mm -hmm. and containers. Mm -hmm. They are considering a one stream for recyclables, which to me would be huge. And they're also mm -hmm. looking at taking number three through seven plastics, mm -hmm. which they never have. Mm -hmm. So resource recovery is, is trying to make some modifications to their facility to do one stream recycling, which I would think is going to make it a lot easier for the haulers. Now, whether mm -hmm. they actually are able to implement that, you know, we'll find out some initial um, information on Thursday, but they are looking the towards one stream recycling. Yeah, the problem that they have, though, is that for them to go uh, with plastics three through seven is going to require an additional building being constructed at the resource recovery uh, in Johnston. And uh, while they were online to construct that, when they've lost most of the business because most of the trash that's a commercial trash is going out of state at this point, uh, I believe that what they have done is to uh, put that building construction on hold at this point. So with that, it will delay us being able to move into an area where uh, one of the difficulties with recycling just one and two plastics is that many people uh, are not aware of what are three through seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, manufacturers don't do a very good job of identifying what the plastic is other than that uh, small number that if, uh, if you don't have a, a magnifying glass, you're not gonna be able to read uh, <laughs> what it is. So it, it's a case where we were hopeful to see them go uh, as a one through seven plastic, uh, but I don't think that's gonna happen in the immediate future. But the single waste stream would certainly uh, uh, be something that uh, would, uh, uh, I think, promote more waste be uh, being, uh, being removed because people wouldn't have to think about what they were doing. They would just know it's one bin or the other. And, and some of the halls right now, they have it structured that it's containers one week, paper the next. So you gotta, mm -hmm. oh, you know, what's this week? Yeah. With, with single stream, See what the neighbors have it out. goes out. Yeah. And, and what happens to them if they um, take a bag of, say, glass bottles and try and dump it at the uh, transfers, you know? dump it like trash they get well, the, the haulers that come in with the they haulers. have to you know if they come in with a load of recyclables they yeah. have to go and tip it as recyclables mm -hmm. and if we catch them and that really it's surprisingly hasn't been a problem we haven't found any of the private haulers trying to dump recyclables mm -hmm. as refuse well, and, and again financially is a disincentive because the tip fee at the transfer station for solid waste I believe is around 52 a ton for the recyclables it's ten dollars a load so there would be actually a financial disincentive for them to tip it as solid waste sure. versus tipping it as recyclables. So if they can get, you know, uh, two tons on a truck at $10, mm -hmm. it's $5 a ton versus 50 something a ton. So there's, right. there's we, we tried to set it up as, I guess, a kind of a carrot mm -hmm. that there's a financial incentive for them to recycle. And of course, the more they recycle from their customers, it reduces their solid waste tip fee as well. So there's really some initiative or financial incentives for them to, to recycle to the greatest extent possible, but it costs money to recycle. Recycling mm -hmm. is not a free proposition. The last thing that, uh, that I wanted to mention is that uh, based on the five-year contract that we have with the uh, uh, operator of the transfer station, the bag tag fees will go have to uh, increase from $1.70 to $1.80, and that uh, will occur uh, for July 1st. So. Uh, that increase is uh, a part of the uh, the budget at this uh, at this time. Other questions on uh, solid waste? Any other questions? Nope. Again, each of these enterprise funds, there's no property taxes that go to either uh, to any of the three. All of those are paid for through the user fees that are generated from the uh, uh, the, the program users. If there's uh, no questions, we're gonna go back to the general fund and we're gonna go back to the recreation program and that will start on page uh, N36.
And on the number detail, it's on uh, uh, the expenditure sheets GF19. So we're on N36. Uh, our leisure services director is uh, here to, uh, to provide the full presentation tonight. <laughs> and she's asked me to keep quiet so she can talk about everything that, uh, that she's involved with. <laughs> Uh, first account is public uh, uh, parks and recreation uh, administration. The narrative, again, this narrative provides a great deal of detail on the programs that are being run in the recreation uh, department. Let me start in, in capsule form. The recreation budget is made up of uh, uh, several uh, components. General administration, maintenance division, our athletics programs, the aquatic programs, leisure services programs, creative activities, uh, which Stepping Stone School, as well as the uh, $7,000 contribution that we make to the two parades. We're proposing a budget for recreation in, uh, in total of $1,317,000. It's a $3,300 uh, uh, decrease from what the current year budget is. We're also anticipating that revenues that uh, will come from the uh, various recreation components will be approximately $594,000, $593,295 to be exact. That's about a $24,000 increase over the current year. And what that means is that the recreation budget that you have before you tonight, in summary, would need about uh, $27,000 less in property taxes than it had in the current year budget. So this budget, like each of our other budgets, uh, are showing declines, yet increases in revenue base as a means of trying to meet, uh, uh, meet the, uh, the budgetary issues that uh, we're faced with in the 10, 11 year. That's, in summary, what the overall program is. And now we want to uh, talk about uh, each of the different uh, departments. Uh, administration is down $20,000. A portion of that $20,000 decline is based on us merging the senior services director and recreation director's uh, salaries into one position. Uh, we've got a savings of approximately uh, 20% in the recreation administration uh, with that shared position. The remainder of the shared position savings will be in the senior program itself. Uh, if there's no questions on administration, I'd like to move forward to, uh, to the uh, uh, maintenance, parks and maintenance division. And uh, uh, I'll let uh, Terry address that component, which is also down about $3,200 from the uh, current year yes the um, with park maintenance we've really what we've done is tried to reduce our expenditures as much as possible without um, limiting or eliminating any of the services that we provide with um, with regard to parks and facilities um, you'll notice that seasonal salaries has been reduced by two thousand six hundred seventy two dollars and as well as overtime costs we have uh, reduced the hours of our part-time seasonal uh, bike path attendant from 40 hours to 26 hours. Um, we've also reduced the overtime um, costs as well. Uh, what we're looking to do is have organizations that we assist with, particularly with field um, preparation, um, share some of the uh, some of the costs of the. Uh, lining of the fields and maintenance of the fields as the seasons get extended beyond what the regular seasons are for <coughs> baseball, uh, soccer, Little League, things like that. Um, we've also seen a reduction in the uh, agricultural and animal materials and supplies um, by $1,336. And additionally, in total, we have a um, reduction of $3,281 in the uh, park maintenance division. Again, I think what we're attempting to do is to do more with less. And uh, 
you know, we've got a talented staff that uh, has a great deal of work to do in terms of the number of uh, parklands that uh, we are maintaining either for uh, you know, the, the bike paths as well as the, uh, the various uh, fields that are maintained in, uh, 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 but like every department, what we're attempting to do is to cut back on those costs to uh, uh, meet budget, uh, budget issues. So uh, we're down $3,200 on that. I'd like to move into the uh, program budgets uh, that are presented. The first is the athletics uh, program. Terry, you want to go over those? Sure. <clears throat> With our athletic programs, we have seen um, an increase in not only the, um, the youth leagues, but also the, um, the drop-in and adult leagues with regard to basketball, volleyball, um, in the local in the local schools, uh, on a regular basis, so we've seen an, a, an increase in the adult participation rates. Um, our revenues are up this year beyond what we anticipated, and we see that continuing into 2010-11. Um, uh, we are reducing our recreation supplies um, by nine thousand three hundred and seventy dollars, and. Uh, we have a total reduction, excuse me, the total reduction for athletics is $9,370. Um, to give you an idea, when we talk about the uh, athletics programs, just the multitude of programs that are out there, we've got sports camps, the skateboard camps, tennis program, uh, drop-in leagues, youth basketball for both boys and girls, uh, instructional uh, 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 baseball, uh, uh, basketball, travel teams for basketball, volleyball, softball, and just general administration. When you look at all of the athletic programs that are listed here, our uh, overall cost is $231,000, and we're expecting to generate about $250,000 from program participation. So in essence, uh, what we have as an athletics program is a, uh, a fee service based program with us really providing the general administration to be able to offer that multitude of different programs. Mm -hmm. So from a tax standpoint, there are no taxes that go into that athletic program whatsoever. Uh, other than the general administrative costs that are not budgeted in the recreation account that deal with uh, personnel benefits. If there's uh, no questions, uh, we can move on to the, uh, the next account in uh, recreation. And that would be the aquatics program. The aquatics program uh, we're looking at a budget of uh, 90, uh, $97,505. And there's really two program components here. One is the operation of the town beach. The town beach operations is about $83,525 is the uh, uh, budget forecast. Uh, that's up about $3,000 over current year. We also are looking at a program for the uh, uh, surf instruction program, and that surf instruction program has a cost of about $14,000, yet it generates revenue uh, of about $17,500. Uh, so what we're looking at is that the beach program this year will have a tax cost associated of about, uh, about $3,000. The surf program has been uh, very popular, uh, and as you can see, uh, it's generating uh, revenue in excess of what expenses are for that program. Anything else you need to put in on that one, Terry? Uh, no, that's good. Next component is the leisure services on GF 22. And to provide explanation on 
those different programs. Within the leisure services uh, budget, we provide for uh, the concerts that the uh, rec department uh, uh, sponsors, as well as the uh, 4th of July uh, program, uh, the discovery camp and adventure camp during the, uh, the summer months, as well as a number of small programs like uh, uh, the Easter, uh, Easter uh, bunny hunt, the uh, children's festival uh, around uh, Halloween, as well as the nature center. We have cut back on the size of the program for the Nature Center. Uh, and at this point, uh, we're uh, reducing, I believe, by 50% the seasonal salaries that are associated with that program. You may want to talk more about that. Uh. Yes, we this year we had um, budgeted $4,000 for a Nature Center coordinator um, to produce programs um, at the Tripon Nature Center. At this time, we haven't seen the participation levels that we had anticipated, and in light of that, we've cut back on the, uh, the nature coordinator's um, salary and are looking to expand programming in, uh, and div diversify programming at the nature center through, through other forms of arts and crafts and other classes of that nature beyond just nature-centered programs in hopes of um, being able to utilize the facility more because it's a beautiful building, um, to get people in there, to expose them to it, and also to increase revenues and hopefully cover more of the operating costs of the, uh, the nature center facility itself. As the budget uh, documents, we're looking at a, a program cost of $143,397. We will uh, generate about $121,000 in revenue uh, within the uh, uh, leisure services uh, program elements. So we're providing tax subsidy of around $22,000. It's important to note that of that $22,000, over almost $13,000 of it, $12,870, is money that uh, uh, property tax money that goes into the 4th of July program that uh, does not come back to us in the, in the form of revenue. We're also still subsidizing uh, uh, a small portion of the discovery camp in terms of trying to keep the fees down for people that are using the, uh, uh, the discovery camp uh, for, uh, uh, I won't call it daycare services, but uh, to, uh, to provide an opportunity for the kids to uh, uh, participate in the, uh, the, the summer programs uh, at the various town parks. Uh, so we're still subsidizing that a bit, but not to the extent that we were several years ago. So at this point, uh, uh, there'd be about $22,500 in property tax subsidy, of which almost 13,000 is related to 4th of July. Uh, we're still expecting that the cost of the fireworks for the 4th of July would uh, be a contribution of around $23,000. Uh, from the town, uh, as well as you know, seasonal salaries associated with that day to pay staff to uh, be able to uh, uh, put that event on. So uh, program sponsors, we're also looking to promote uh, use of program sponsors uh, for various events that we have, particularly with 4th of July. Uh, we're looking, at this point, we're forecasting $9,000 in uh, donations that uh, will go toward the, uh, that uh, uh, that one day celebration. Questions or uh, comments on that? The, uh, the last uh, component of the uh, recreation programs is in our creative activities uh, program and that is the uh, program at the uh, Stepping Stone School. And uh, there are Three real components here, as well as the facility maintenance. Uh, we use about $10,000 in trust funds to be able to uh, pay for uh, uh, a lion's share of the, uh, the operating costs associated with uh, keeping that building up to snuff, as well as the uh, building maintenance, janitorial supplies. That cost element's around $15,000. The school that we operate, the pre, uh, preschool program that we operate, uh, costs about $57,000, of which we generate about 60,000 
or $61,500 in income. So the program, the, the preschool program that we operate, the pre-K, is uh, uh, without uh, property tax support. We also are uh, having community classes that uh, are uh, cited within that building for, uh, for the children, as well as the Safety First program, which is the pre-K program to get the uh, children ready for getting on school buses and understanding uh, look both ways, that type of thing. Those programs have been highly successful in the past and we continue to operate those. Revenue that'll be generated uh, from the uh, uh, Stepping Stone School is estimated at, at uh, $77,348 and our cost uh, predicted for Stepping Stone is $77,258. Uh, so in essence, there'd be about a $90 tax contribution to keep that, uh, that entire program in operation. Other comments on that? Uh, uh, just one comment regarding our enrollment this year. There seemed to be a, a, a slight decline um, in the four to five year old uh, group, which is atypical of, of this program. From what I understand, it's usually at maximum capacity. Um, going forward, we don't anticipate that to happen in the 2010-11 year, but in the event that it does, we're looking at options of um, doing a split class if necessary with the three to four year olds combined with the four to five year olds to, to maximize our capacity. Questions or comments uh, from council? If not, we'll move on to the uh, Peacedale office building uh, account, and that's on page PDOB one, uh, and it's account 310. Could you use the microphone? Yeah, please come up and use the microphone. I'm very bad at these things. Before you go on to the Peacedale office building, and I don't, mm -hmm. back on page, I saw a line about eliminating the money for hearing. On page uh, N36, the second from the last, maybe these are just proposals, 10 or 12 of them, eliminate, second from the bottom of those box bullets, elimination of funding for Wakefield Civic, Wakefield Concert Band. That's correct. Is that a proposed or is that? Is That's proposed in this budget. Is this a moment for me to say, I object? Yeah, I, I think that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, do we have public comment now? Certainly, go right ahead. Okay. I can't, um, I mean, the Wakefield Concert Band has just been named the Wakefield Concert Band in light of its tremendous expansion when Barry Lieberman came here as the conductor in 2001. It was a far smaller outfit. I was in it then. <laughs> We produced, a mag I think, a terrific CD in 2003. I, re uh, I continued into, two into 2005 and for various reasons dropped out, but boy, they've gone, seems to me they're on a tremendous growth cu uh, curve. I'm sure people here heard them on, the, on January 31 in the second of their concerts supporting the South County Hospital. Absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, if I may, Steve, uh, the Wakefield Concert Band, because of their success um, and their popularity within the community, is actually a program that is, is now able to stand on its own without the assist of town subsidy. Okay. They're, they're, they're thriving, they're doing so well, okay. in fact, that they actually don't need us anymore. <laughs> so you, that's the reason for this? Correct. Service. We will still Good. support the Wakefield Concert Band in um, the summer concerts that they do at Marina Park will we'll provide in-kind services with setting up for, for the concerts, and in turn, they will continue to provide the wonderful concerts that they provide for, huh. for the town. I would thank you. You're welcome. We were just an incubator for them. Pardon me? I said we were just an incubator for them. They're yeah. out on their own. Oh, that's great. Good. Uh -huh. right. It is a great thing. It is. Mm. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, Peacedale Office Building. Uh, I think the easiest way to deal with this is just in terms of introduction for everybody, the uh, Peacedale office building, uh, I think people are aware, was constructed back in 1856 by the uh, Peacedale Mill uh, Company. 
The town purchased that uh, building in 1983 with the intent to accommodate expanded recreational programming opportunities. In essence, it would uh, provide us, and still does provide us with the flexibility to be able to expand uh, activities which uh, now are housed within the, uh, the neighborhood guild uh, uh, complex. The, uh, the town, since 1983, has leased out for commercial space uh, portions of the building. At this point, we have seven tenants. Uh, the rest of the building is used for uh, uh, year-round uh, public programming, such things as uh, uh, you know, dance programs, aerobics, karate, yoga, and fitness programs are housed within that uh, facility and uh, provide relief from having to try to uh, uh, present those programs within the, uh, the guild itself. At this point, uh, we're looking at a, uh, a budget for the 2010-2011 year, which would be a $2,874 increase over the current year. Much of that uh, increase is directly related to expanding the number of programs, public programs that are being run at the facility. If you uh, uh, go to uh, page uh, two of the budget narrative, you'll see an explanation of building use. Again, uh, seven tenants. Uh, we're expecting income of around uh, uh, $17,300 from the different self-supporting activities that uh, are occurring there. The rents from the property itself generate almost $74,280. But the types of programs that are being operated uh, in the Peacedale office building include the uh, sports and fitness uh, uh, programs, youth and, uh, uh, and teen programs. Uh, so the, the building is still in a, uh, a joint use. One of the important things, if you look at the budget detail, the expenditure statement on page three, is that as of uh, June 30th of 2009, Peacedale office building had uh, a fund balance, uh, undesignated fund balance available of about $193,000. That money's available for us to reinvest in that building for any improvements that need to be made. I think the council's well aware of, since we purchased that property in 1983, we have really redeveloped the entire facility. Uh, new heating systems, new roofs, new windows, uh, uh, repointing of, uh, of the uh, stone facade, uh, all have been, uh, been completed. We uh, have an estimate that we will be over $200,000 in reserve as of the end of the 9-10 year. As we move forward, if there's more needs uh, for public use of the building, we will uh, be in a position to be able to diminish the uh, commercial rent, uh, rental space that's in place there. One other uh, important component is that uh, the, when we purchased the building back in 1983, one of the agreements that the town made was to uh, provide uh, in perpetuity space for the, uh, uh, for the museum, mm -hmm. and uh, we continue to house the museum. One of the things that we're also doing is we have uh, subsequently provided on a fee basis, a very minimal fee basis, additional uh, floor space for the administration of the museum to be able to uh, spread out. Uh, they are looking to renew those uh, uh, rental agreements at this point with us. Uh, we will have discussions with them. Uh, we certainly will uh, continue to honor the request to have that museum there. However, the cost of the space associated with the administrative office space that they're looking for most likely is gonna require some type of a fee increase for the uh, uh, for the renewal. Uh, if all goes well, uh, we do not have any capital improvements that are planned for the Peacedale office building at this point. Uh, one of the considerations in the past has been the addition of a uh, uh, elevator. Uh, I have not been a strong proponent for that uh, based on how it would be integrated into a historically significant building as well as how the space redistribution that would be required uh, to the interior of that building if there were a elevator uh, to be sited on that site. Also, the utility for that, uh, that elevator is, it, uh, may be in question. M my concern is that we should uh, continue to uh, 
strengthen the reserves available so that when major building improvements are necessary on a building that at this point uh, is uh, 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 getting on to a, uh, 100 and, uh, uh, 120 years of, of age, that uh, we have the proper resources to be able to maintain that as part of the town's holdings. Uh, it's a wonderful gift to have the library, the Peacedale Office Building, and the Guild. Uh, and we know that uh, with the uh, Village Green, that none of that property uh, can be changed or will be changed and will, will look the same 100 years from now. But we need to be stewards of all of those parcels to ensure that the buildings are properly uh, kept up to standards uh, and to uh, protect the, uh, the historical integrity of those buildings. Questions on uh, Peace Dell Office Building? Nope. Helen, I'm sure you're in favor of that. <laughs> okay, if we move on, uh, the, the, uh, the next account is the Neighborhood Guild, and that starts on NG1, and I'll turn it over to Terry to give you some uh, of the facts and figures. The total proposed operational budget for the Neighborhood Guild is $817,614, which represents a reduction of $32,044, or 3.8% less than the 2009-10 adopted budget. Some of the major changes um, to the Guild budget for this 10-11 uh, year, um, the overall administration expenditures have decreased by $16,594, primarily due to personnel changes, um, with consolidation of the directors of uh, senior services and Department of Parks and Recreation positions. Uh, project projected revenues have been adjusted downward to account for anticipated decrease in the Guild fund balance and overall programming revenues to decline by approximately $16,700. The decrease in programming revenues is partially due to the economy, particularly with the decline of participation in, in the school vacation camps that take place um, in December and February and April. Um, the Senior Trips program has also been adjusted to a more realistic figure of $58,400 down from $65,300. We don't anticipate running uh, many of the overnight trips due to the economy, um, being conscious of the fact that the discretionary inc people's discretionary income is at a minimum at this time. Uh, the two programming areas where we project an increase are the front desk operations, which administers the use of the fitness room, the sauna, facility rental, and vending machines. Uh, the use of the fitness room and sauna have seen an increase, and <coughs> adult programming is an additional area that we anticipate increase, particularly in gen the general community education classes, which have been on the rise. Um, we've also instituted a fee increase for creative writing uh, for the 10-11 fiscal year. The NAP School of Music program continues to remain stable. We have new instructors who are slowly building up a student base and who continue, and we continue to bring new instructors on board. Um, of note, we've just introduced a brand new music program for students with special needs um, that we anticipate being able to expand to a, a broader population. And we've increased the registration fee uh, by $5, which will be instituted in 10-11. Um, we'll the Guild will continue to seek alternative low-cost methods of marketing our programs, um, in particular uh, electronic media, as well as targeted outreach. Um, we've seen um, the cost of postage just to skyrocket in terms of the brochures that we would like to send out, but unfortunately it's, the, it's just cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for al alternative methods um, in terms of marketing. Um, we're also um, making efforts to de decrease program subsidies by seeking alternative funding such as sponsorships and donations, which we do currently, but we're hoping to be able to expand that as well. Um, we'll continue to use our in-house skills. Um, we have some very talented employees to help maintain the actual facility. Um, this year, we've um, gone through some, some renovations in terms of some of the rooms in the, in the guild, um, and we're, we're fortunate to have that 
um, resource within the town rather than having to contract out and incur more expenses. Um, we're looking to implement also web-based registration again um, to make it more convenient for our participants rather than having to come in and uh, register. We're hoping to be able to get that back online with the help of our uh, IT department. Overall, we're really seeking to maintain the same level of programming at affordable rates, um, utilizing a combination of independent contractors, sponsorships, donations, and, and in-house resources. One of the things that uh, I mention on a yearly basis is that what we've attempted to do with the Guild program is to generate sufficient revenue from the uh, Guild trust funds and reinvested income as well as the Hazard Trust to be able to pay for the upkeep, maintenance, and operation of the building so that the building is there for the programs to operate. So if the programs can operate at a break-even proposition, that we're providing uh, the proper services. When you look at the revenue statement on page six, you see that the general fund, uh, the guild fund balance, the guild trust funds, has a trust, investment income and reinvested income, which pays for the debt uh, service. That amounts to about $479,000. When you go to page four, which shows you the operations of the guild itself, the operations of the guild is 492,000. So we're very close to being able to uh, provide a building for the public's use without any cost to, uh, to heat or to maintain that building. So the beauty of the guild is to be able to provide indoor recreation and leisure service activities without having to have somebody pay for the building cost associated with being able to run those programs. So we're, we're close to it. If we can get some additional improvements as far as energy conservation uh, in place with that building, we're hopeful that uh, we'll be able to see uh, a time when we can get the entire cost of the building in place. Right now, uh, the uh, $35,000 that comes from the front desk is also used to pay for the operations of the, of the facility itself. So that's part of that $479,000. But our objective in the long run is to uh, attempt to keep this as close to balance as possible with the operations of the facility. That way the programs are not uh, being required to charge uh, for really uh, what would be almost a building surcharge. So we're, we're close to it. The building's in good shape. You're aware that under the capital improvement program, was, we've got authorization to go forward with a million dollar bond. We will look to do that upon the uh, retiring of the existing million dollar bond that I think was originally sold in 1996, was yes. it? Nin 1996. So it'll be around the uh, 15, 16 year that uh, that would be free. We, would, we had hoped that we would be able to get that uh, uh, out sooner. That depends on what the markets do as far as the uh, uh, Guild Trust Fund uh, and the availability of, of income from that to uh, defray future costs on the debt service. Mm -hmm. Any questions on the Guild? Jim? Yeah, is there a count you get of who comes through the door? Um, I mean, how many South Kingstown residents have used it in a given year this past year? We have um, a, a program called RecWare, where people who are registered for our programs obviously have to provide all of their information. We could run reports that would show you're talking residents versus non-residents. Um, we, we would have access to that. Yeah, just percentage that of residents. I don't, didn't know if it was 5, 10 percent of our residents that may use it for one uh, purpose or another. You, know, you mean total number of residents that have used the Guild in, yeah. in, the, in the course of a year? Just a different face. I mean, whether you know, each individual that's walked through the door that's registered in some kind of a program. Right. Um, I, I don't know that figure, um, but it's something that we could. No, I, do, I don't want you to make a new program for that. I just <laughs> thought maybe you kept a, a measure of some kind of uh, local families. And, uh, um, we do. We, do. we can draw that information from the RecWare pro program. We most certainly can. Yeah. Um, what we can tell you, Jim, is that if you look on page, uh, uh, page two of the narrative, the total attendance for guild usage on the bottom of that page 
We're estimating that we're serving about 62,000 visits a year. That's certainly not uh, unique visits, but as far as people coming in and out of the doors, uh, you've got about 60,000 people that, uh, that visit the guild on the course of the year. Obviously, if somebody goes 300 times, uh, 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 yeah, I, I just fine, but... Uh, I saw that number, I was just trying to break it down, but you know, I, I appreciate that. Okay, if there's no questions, uh, I'd like to move on then to the Senior Services Program, and that's uh, in the narrative section, uh, starts on page S1, and this is the uh, uh, Senior Services Program, budget account uh, 345. Page one of the uh, senior services uh, program provides a uh, line item detail of the different services that are rendered through the senior services program. Senior services transportation program, senior services, uh, the nutrition program, our adult day services program, and the senior center program itself. So those four components make up the senior services uh, 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 overall uh, budget. The projected cost for the 2010-2011 year is $714,648. That's a decrease of $38,372. The major reason for the decrease in senior service program for the 2010-2011 uh, year is the merger of the leisure services director's position from senior services director and recreation director. To give you an idea, the senior services director's position was funded last year at 100%. The cost, uh, cost of that with benefits was approaching uh, uh, about $90,500. Uh, 90, and you get done with longevity, uh, cost of health care, workers' comp, FICA, and uh, uh, retirement uh, cost. We've reduced that cost by 70%. Uh, because we've now got a leisure services director who's 30% uh, budgeted in senior services, 40% uh, budgeted in senior services, and 60% uh, budgeted in the recreation program. So the overall reduction in personnel and benefit-related costs is around uh, $62,000. So when we look at the budget uh, reduction by 38,000, most of that is in reallocation of labor or the reduction in the labor that was directly assigned to senior programming for the 10-11 uh, year. So that is a general comment. I'd like to uh, then walk through the, uh, uh, the various uh, program components. But before I do, let me also mention that we provide services on behalf of Narragansett and North Kingstown in our adult day services program. Both of those communities contribute uh, a fair share to South Kingstown to underwrite the cost associated with their residents using our programs. The town of Narragansett also uh, contributes to the, uh, to the uh, in addition to the adult day services, contributes uh, to the nutrition program and contributes to the uh, senior center itself based on uh, their resident population using our services. We believe that, uh, that having a senior center that's open to all seniors and providing opportunity for people from Narragansett and South Kingstown to, uh, to meet together in one location makes a lot of sense. Geographic boundaries shouldn't be making a difference as to where friends are able to meet uh, friends or where friends are able to have uh, a nutritious meal for lunch. Uh, Narragansett has recognized that and has been a strong partner with our senior program and continues to be. North Kingstown has been a strong partner over the last three years in terms of uh, uh, full participation on costs associated with North Kingstown residents using the adult day services program. So 
I want to recognize them and hopefully we'll, we will see the same level of contribution uh, that uh, we have seen in past years. So with that as an introduction, uh, I'd like to uh, go on to uh, uh, page S5, the transportation program. Uh, Terry, you want to talk about this for a minute? Sure. The transportation program has a proposed budget for the 10-11 year of $69,232, um, representing a 12.8% uh, decrease over the previous year. And as Steve had mentioned, um, much of that decrease is, is due primarily to personnel, personnel costs. Uh, we, we had budgeted 10% of Rick's salary in the transportation budget. We have removed that in its entirety as far as uh, 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 Terry's time. Um, just a note about the, um, the current status of our transportation program in South Kingstown. It continues to uh, be available to seniors 60 years of age and older um, to transport to not only the senior center but to other locations that are essential to seniors uh, maintaining independence, which includes grocery shopping, uh, retail shopping, banking, and, and pharmacies. Um, of note, in 2008, when the state program, uh, ride program, um, started to charge a fee for service um, for seniors to get to and from meal sites, South Kingstown assumed that role and began transporting to and from the senior center for, uh, for daily meals. Um, before 2008, the state had, had provided that transportation. Um, the van program was also able before 2008 to provide um, trips, but once we began the transportation to se the senior meal site, the van trips, which were very popular at the time, um, had to be curtailed because, of course, the, the new transportation to a nutrition site is, uh, takes precedent over um, recreational trips. Um, hopefully in the future, with the um, funding through capital improvement to uh, buy a new van, we'll be able to have a spare van in the future so that we can reinstitute uh, a trip program. Um, we have, <coughs> just to give you some, some figures, we have about 400 riders per month. That's, that's not unduplicated, obviously. That's, that's uh, um, ridership per week same riders, but number of number of trips that they may be taking, whether it's to the senior center or uh, for shopping purposes. Um, again, there's no charge for this service, and we feel that implementing a fee for the service obviously would would hurt the, those very people that we're trying to get to attend to the senior center to to get a, a nutritious meal every day, um, probably their main meal of the day. Um, we're not inclined to charge a fee for that service while other communities may, we, we don't feel that at this time that that's something that we'd, we'd want to implement. Um, again, in, in the future, if we do have the opportunity to purchase that new van, um, a spare van would come in very handy in, in terms of being able to offer more programming um, with regard to, to trips for seniors, which is a real popular um, element of senior programming. Any questions? Uh, yes, Polly. When you say trips, Terry, wh wh what do these trips go to? I'm talking about the general uh, day trips, um, short-term short trips to, um, say, a mall, and then out to lunch, where it's a um, time frame of maybe four or, five, four or five hours. Seniors leave the center at a certain time, mm -hmm. go shopping, have lunch, return to the center. Um, gives them the opportunity to do something different. Yes, and you've had to cut those out. For well, now. those were those those were cut before 2008. Karen, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, at that time, when senior services had to assume had to pick the, the pickups for the meal site, yeah. um, it see. didn't allow oh. enough time to provide um, no, day trips as nice. well. I'm sorry they had to be cut out. Well, hopefully we'll see them yes. back again. I mean, our objective was when we began this program was to have on a call-in basis. Seniors could call us that uh, were homebound and uh, didn't have transportation if they needed to go to the hairdresser or to the bank, anything other than medical runs, uh, that we would be able to provide the transportation and we could set up schedules where we would pick them up 
get them to the, uh, to the grocery market or to, uh, uh, to the various stores in town and then be able to get them back to their home. A lot of that focus changed <coughs> when uh, we had to take over the responsibility for getting people to and from the meal site. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're still doing that, it's just less hours mm -hmm. that are available per week for us to be able to uh, assign the driver, to be able to go out to Green Hill, pick somebody up, bring them into town, and hopefully one, or th one to three or four people that would be from a general area. And what they try to do is to get uh, people to pick the same day that are from the same areas uh, so that there's an economy of scale. It's still an expensive program based mm -hmm. on the ridership that you have. If you broke the program down to a rider base based on the cost of the program, you're probably talking about $15 per, per rider uh, mm -hmm. that you're servicing over the course of the year. Uh, if you're servicing the, you know, uh, 400 riders a month, because that would be 4,800 uh, riders a year, divided into the, uh, uh, the total budget of the $70,000. So it's still <coughs> an expensive proposition, but being in a rural area without public transportation mm -hmm. availability, mm -hmm. uh, we really have to provide this service to uh, uh, be able to accommodate that, uh, that, that segment of the population that uh, doesn't drive or in some cases shouldn't drive. Mm -hmm. The uh, second program is the, uh, the town's nutrition program. The nutrition program is run at the senior center. We break that out as a, uh, as a separate component from the senior center uh, as a means of keeping track of uh, the persons that are making use of the program. If you look on the bottom of page S6, S6 breaks out the, uh, uh, the nutrition program cost. We're forecasting a cost of $101,632. We'll receive from the state uh, a whopping $2,341. So our cost is about $100,000 with the program. The, uh, the ratio at this point is 64 or 65% of the people of South Kingstown that are partaking in the meals. 35% are partaking in the meals are from Narragansett. The cost distribution there is that Narragansett will contribute on a fair share basis there, 35%, which would be $34,865. Again, that's been requested of Narragansett. Their budget hearings will be uh, sometime latter part of, uh, uh, of this month. Uh, we have full faith that they will continue to uh, uh, meet their responsibilities in, in terms of the the program uh, itself. Another component of the nutrition program is we isolate 30% of the operating costs associated with a senior center and back charge the nutrition program. Part of that $100,000 is uh, approximately $16,000, $15,821 to be exact. That's operational costs of the center. That would be uh, the space allocated for the kitchen as well as the, uh, the dining areas, or for those hours that the dining area really is a dining area rather than an activity center. The meals program is a key component of the, uh, of the senior center. Uh, it's one of the reasons that people come. They make, uh, a lot of times they will come early and stay late with the other activities that are there. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, the meals component that which pays for the meals itself uh, is provided uh, uh, through uh, about uh, $97,000 is the estimated cost at $7.10 per meal. Is uh, uh, The raw food comes through the uh, uh, West Bay Community Action Program which gets federal money for uh, being able to supply that. So what we're doing is we're providing the facility, the, uh, the kitchen facilities as well as the, uh, uh, the room for the, uh, uh, for the meal and the uh, federal government via the state uh, through the CAP agency provides for the kitchen and provides the food. So overall, this is about $200,000 worth of program activity that's occurring there. Uh, the food is not our cost. The food comes in prepared uh, uh, on a daily basis. It's still one of the, uh, the best programs that I think that we can have as a magnet to bring people in together and for them to uh, uh, be able to enjoy the other benefits of the center. Uh, 
uh, I noticed in their newsletter today that they've got a free dance, uh, and free dance means you can dance any way you want. <laughs> and that also means that you can sit on a chair and dance at the, uh, if that's how you feel like dancing. So there's a lot of those type of program activities that uh, uh, generate a lot of interest. Uh, I always enjoy reading their newsletter on a uh, monthly basis uh, uh, and am amazed at some of the program activities mm -hmm. that occur there. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure if I want to participate in them, but uh, <laughs> uh, or or to be eligible to participate in them, but uh, I, I think uh, we should be well proud of what goes on there. Uh, if we move on to page S8, if there's no questions, uh, the adult uh, day services program. The proposed budget uh, on the daycare program, uh, day services program is 290,000, it's down $3,400 from the current year. 40% of uh, Rick's budget, uh, Rick's salary had been allocated to this uh, program. 20% of Terry's salary is allocated to this program at this point, so that's where some of the uh, uh, cost reduction is occurring. The other thing that we're seeing is that uh, we're anticipating an increase in the number of uh, participants. If you look at page S8, you can see that uh, the actual usage that we had uh, client days of 2,878 days uh, in the 08, 09 year. We are forecasting that that uh, program will see uh, 3,637 days of uh, uh, program activities and we're up from an average daily client uh, uh, day of 12 uh, clients to a forecast of 15. The number of clients that we're serving is uh, 41, and they, uh, 15 of those are coming from South Kingstown, mm -hmm. 11 from Narragansett, and nine from North Kingstown. Just the no those numbers don't mean a lot because if, somebody, if you have 15 people and each of them comes two days a week, it's far different than if you have five people and they come five days a week. So what, we're, what we measure is client days uh, rather than just looking at the, uh, the uh, unique client uh, numbers that are presented there. We're also forecasting that the state uh, subsidies for the client base based on the income levels of the people participating in the program will increase from about 74,000 to about 90, $92,500 next year. Uh, we're also uh, seeing that as that increases, we're forecasting that, uh, that there will be an increase in what the client payments will be. So overall, our revenues from uh, state reimbursement as well as our revenues uh, from uh, clients paying for services uh, will increase. If you uh, turn to uh, uh, page nine, page nine is another uh, breakout of the program. Uh, here we're talking about the 290,000 net of the state uh, share, the client share in miscellaneous revenues and investment income. So we're looking to recover $109,872 from the three municipalities that have uh, clients going uh, to the facility. As you can see, uh, the uh, leader here is North Kingstown. North Kingstown has 1,186 client days. And again, the client days that we're talking about here uh, run from, I believe it's uh, October of 08 through, uh, no November 1st, 08 uh, through uh, October 30 of 2009. So we're taking the actual days, we're basing next year's budget based on what has occurred this year. Next year at this time, we'll look at the actual travel for that same period of time in 10, 11 year and forecast the budget based on, on those numbers. But at this point, based on what the daily membership was for that most uh, recent year when the budget was prepared, 38.8% was coming from North Kingstown. And these are uh, the dollars that are necessary to be recouped uh, and we have sent uh, uh, letters of request to Narragansett for the uh, 26,856 and North Kingstown for $42,696. Uh, 
and South Kingstown share on the daycare uh, day services program would be 40,000 or down about uh, $2,000 from the uh, current year. Uh, Terry, you wanna talk about the program? Sure. Uh, what we've seen in the adult day services program, while, while we, we can never be certain of obviously the, the, the attendance rates and from, from which communities our, our clients are coming from, um, it's clear that there is a trend of an increased need. Um, people are living longer. Um, there are needs in the community. People want their loved ones to stay in the community, uh, stay in their homes as long as possible. Adult Day Services gives them the opportunity to do this where they can place their loved ones in, a, in an environment that's safe um, and they know they're being taken care of during the day and then be at home with their, their parent, their children or or uh, caregivers in the evening. Um, we have seen the increase. We anticipate that that will continue. There, there was also a concerted effort over the past year before, before I, I was here um, with regards to outreach into the community. Um, doctor's offices were contacted. Um, there was a raised awareness of the adult day services program within, within the town, um, which contributed to the increase in the, in the um, client base. Um, I was at the adult day services today and for the past week or so we've been up to at our maximum of 20 clients a day. So there definitely is um, a rise in the need and, and the attendance. Um, it's a great program. We're excited um, at the opportunity to expand the facility, which I know thanks to the CDBG funding and capital improvement um, planning that we looks like we'll be able to do that. Um, that will enable us to not only have a better functioning facility with added space in terms of rooms, quiet rooms, um, areas for case managers to meet with caregivers. Um, with the we, we will also have the opportunity to increase um, clients as well, the client base as well. One of the other things we've done is the entire uh, interior of the building's been repainted in the oh, last uh, three true. months. Uh, uh, it was needed, it, it's brightened up the place and uh, it, it certainly looks, uh, looks much nicer at this point. If there's no questions, I'd like to move on to the uh, uh, senior center itself. Polly has a question. Could I ask, oh. uh, you're, are you able to take everyone who applies for the adult daycare center? Or you will be when you have an addition? Well, can you not announce? necessarily. I mean, there will always be a maximum capacity that, that we can take. Um, in which case, wa a waiting list would be developed. But you don't have a waiting list now, Terry? We are just about at the point where we're beginning to see that we may start a waiting list of, of clients. Mm -hmm. um, but up but until now, you've been able to take everyone. Right, based on their, their, the appropriateness of their... Uh, Thank you. Okay, the, uh, the senior center is uh, presented on uh, pages S10 and S11. The uh, budget for the 2010-2011 year is $253,679. That's a, a decrease of $22,996. Most of the decrease is because we had 20% of the senior services director, now there's 10% uh, in there for, uh, for this year. That's inclusive of benefits. Uh, if you look at page 11, page 11 uh, then uh, breaks down the cost, the 253 net of revenues from third party sources. We need $210,000. We're looking at uh, the uh, South Kingstown contributing 175, and we're asking Narragansett for a $35,000 contribution. Narragansett pays full share on day services. Narragansett pays full share on nutrition program, but they pay just a piece of uh, a contribution to the town on the adult uh, on the, uh, the the senior center itself. They have their own senior center. Uh, we're asking them for a contribution and they've been good enough to provide in the past. We're continuing to do that uh, with the 2010-2011 uh, year. Questions? Nope. I don't think so, any questions? No, Mr. Lucas. Terry, anything you need to add? Just wanna comment that the, the center is absolutely thriving. Um, the times that I have been there, been able to, to attend at different times of the day, it really is, it's receiving maximum daytime use, which is, which is really nice to see. Um, 
I think we all, it's also um, noteworthy to comment on the partnerships, particularly with URI, um, that enable us to have so many programs at no cost uh, to, to seniors. Um, also, we have some other programs involving uh, yoga with um, our yoga instructor through the Guild. Richard Tui does it on a volunteer basis. Um, a number of other um, partners as well, South County Hospital, um, Stop and Shop donates baked goods for f free breakfasts. You know, there are, there are just uh, a number of uh, good partners out there that allow us to do a lot of good things um, for, for the senior population. Is there any questions? No. If not, that concludes what we need to go over tonight. Our next uh, session will be at 6.30 on Thursday evening. Okay. Alan, you didn't want to say anything, did you, Alan? No. 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 Okay. No. All right. Then is there any questions from the audience then, just to make sure? Okay. No? Then we are adjourned, I guess. And uh, the time is...